I'm Liam Lawrence Smith. I'm the clerk of the journals in the House of Commons. So I'm a senior professional official in the House of Commons and I'll describe the work of the journal office in a moment. But what I want to say first about the National Council for Voluntary Organisations is a big thank you for the energy and the creativity and the sheer hard work that you and your member organisations have put into helping us make Parliament work better. For example, when I was clerk of a select committee, what a select committee really thrives on is the evidence that it receives and the it's amazing resource that committees have that people are prepared to put in all that time and effort to explaining to members of parliament exactly what's going on. And I think that's what the NCVO really has to offer. It's a kind of reality check and if parliament's going to make law effectively, it's going to scrutinise government effectively, it's incredibly important that you feel you have an opportunity to put your case to parliament and equally that Parliament is well set up and receptive to what you have to say. Now in the Journal Office it's my particular responsibility to look after the formal minutes of the House. So we have records of the House going back to 1547, we've done them in broadly the same way since the middle of the 18th century when the first clerk of the journals was appointed. Now because my office is responsible for the history of the House we naturally are the place people come to for the precedence, what happened in the past, how have we done this before. So procedural advice, advice on the privileges of the House, these are the kind of things that my office deals with. But increasingly now what we deal with is shaping the procedures of the House, modernising and reforming the procedures of the House to make them work for the kind of Parliament we want now. So with the new situation of a coalition government, we really had two things to deal with. One was, how do the procedures of the House need to be changed and adapted to reflect the new situation of a coalition government? And the second and slightly related subject was, how are we going to implement the reforms that the House had already agreed on, following, for example, the Right Committee uh, at the end of the last Parliament? Well, actually, a coalition government wasn't very difficult to manage within the rules that we already have. Um, we're quite clear in our rules what the government's responsibilities are. There's very little said in the rules specifically about political parties. And the Speaker has a great deal of discretion. And I think that's going to be crucial as the Speaker's choice, the Speaker's skill in allowing different voices to be heard means that not only will we have, of course, the clash between government and opposition on the major issues of the day, but also using his skill and discretion, he will ensure that the voices are heard from the back benches of both parties in the coalition. We don't need to be over-prescriptive about rules for that kind of work. Where we are quite strict is looking at party proportions on select committees. So the typical committee of uh, 11 members will have five Conservatives, one Lib Dem and five Labour, giving a coalition majority. Now the reforms we've had this Parliament is the chairs of select committees elected by the whole House. So first of all, the Speaker decided what the arithmetic was, what proportion of chairmanship should go to each of the main parties. Then there were contested elections where we had more than one candidate and the whole House could choose, for example, the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee as long as they chose a member of the opposition and Margaret Hodge won. The whole House could choose the Chairman, the Chair of the Treasury Committee as long as it was Conservative and, and retiring won. It's taken some time since then for agreement to be reached on who the members of the committees are going to be because each party chose its own way of choosing its nominees and then the whole House had to ratify those choices. So typical committee 515, a spread of chairmanships. Those committees are the really lively committees you're more likely to engage with 
the ones that really operate in your particular field of interest. But equally, you want to be aware of how the general committees operate. General committees are set up for a particular task to debate a bill, debate a European document, or to debate a particular statutory instrument, orders and regulations. The typical arithmetic for those committees is going to be on a committee of 18 members, that there should be 10 members from the coalition, normally 8 Conservative, 2 Lib Dems, 7 from the Labour benches and 1 from the other parties. Now those general committees are the committees where the real authority lies, particularly when they're scrutinising bills. And it'll be terribly important to you, on any particular bill you're engaged with, who gets chosen to sit on that committee. And that will be fascinating to see the extent to which the coalition is able to command the loyalty of all parties on its side of that committee. General committees increasingly do have public hearings before they start debating bills. The coalition government intends there should be a public hearing stage and it will be very interesting to see how that develops to try to open up the legislation process to outside groups in a way that I think select committees already do very successfully with their inquiries. There are other things that the coalition government is offering the House. For example, public petitions for debates to really drive a subject onto the agenda of the House could be uh, a significant campaigning tool, I think, which you might be interested in. Um, there is a proposal that there should be a statutory register for lobbying. I don't know how that would work in practice or what interest you would have in making sure that while your status as a lobbyist perhaps was recognised, the rules shouldn't be unduly onerous to prevent you from effectively putting your case over. There are several other really interesting things in the programme, including um, offering specific help to people with disabilities who want to be political candidates, uh, which I think might be very significant for the future. The coalition programme sets out very clearly a considerable body of work which the government intends to bring before Parliament over the next few years. Parliament itself is going to be perhaps better equipped. We have a backbench business committee which will have control of a substantial slice of the House's time, giving more opportunities for outside organisations perhaps to have their cases heard. I think there's a great opportunity in this Parliament for voluntary organisations to come forward to assist Parliament in its job of scrutinising the executive, to make sure that legislation is properly tested and to engage in all the various opportunities that select committees offer. And the question I think that I would be very interested in is, from your point of view, how difficult does it seem to get Parliament to pay attention to what your concerns are?